So let's, um, I will give you the, the welcome to this, um, to the continuation, this uh, second talk by Michael Rexman. My name is Luis Pua Torres. I'm, I'm very happy to, to moderate this uh, second session. So uh, let's, uh, let's continue. Michael, please. All right, thank you. Thank you, Luis. Okay, here I go. Uh, just continuing from the, the previous talk. So um, another experiment that we did at the time was um, um, very similar system, but in a, a triangular orientation. So this is still a honeycomb lattice, but the system itself was triangular. And the reason for that is um, at these 60 degree corners, um, you get a better coupling efficiency to, um, to the, the edge states. So um, this, so what I'm gonna do is look at different samples and scan the radius of the helices. Um, so here we start at zero microns, meaning perfectly straight. So this is exactly the regime that we're asking about. Um, about like. um, you inject light and you don't couple perfectly. Uh, so you do excite some bulk states. So that's what you're seeing in the background here. But um, largely the light that you inject stays where you injected it. So that, that's a consequence of these flat bands um, at, when you have just a standard graphene, standard honeycomb lens. Uh, but then you increase the, um, radius of the helix. And what you see is that the edge states start to move uh, along the um, uh, top edge. The, the, in this case, the helices are going in a clockwise sense and as are the edge states. So in this regime that we're working, the edge states and the helices have the same sense of rotation. So in this case, clockwise. Um, and you see them along the edge there. And here they've wrapped around the corner without scattering, right? By the time you get to six microns. Eight microns, they've wrapped a lot more. Uh, but then as you um, go to 10, 12, 14, and 16 microns, um, you see that they've slowed down. Um, so they're wrapped around the corner, then the group velocity gets lower and lower and they've gone less and less far to the point where at 16 microns, uh, they end up where they started. Um, this is accompanied by a lot of heating because we're really uh, driving the system very hard at this point. And so past 16 microns, we, you know, we don't really um, consider the data to be good enough uh, to uh, be meaningful. Um, so what's happening here, why is it slowing down um, after going faster and faster and, uh, and then slowing down is basically um, very, something very typical of Floquet systems, which is you drive harder and harder the band gap doesn't just keep opening, but in fact, it opens and then it closes again. And then that's where you undergo a topological transition. So the edge states, if they start out flat and you increase the strength of the drive, they sort of they go like this and then they come down. So the group velocity increases and then decreases. And then at the topological transition where the bands touch, um, you, you, know, you have zero group velocity again. Uh, and here it's accompanied by a lot of heating um, or, or uh, bend loss, bending loss, as we call it. And um, so, you know, it becomes kind of, you know, not very great in terms of the signal to noise ratio. So we really wanted to be able to go beyond this regime to actually see what would happen after the topological transition. But in these experiments, we, we couldn't because of the, the heating. Uh, so this is just a plot of the group velocity as a function of um, the, helix radius, which is really just the strength of the drive. Okay. Um, we did another experiment in which we um, injected on the other side and we put in a missing waveguide on purpose. So here's a defect. And what we saw was the um, edge state go around, the defect and go through without any backscattering. Sorry, Mikael, I think we have a question by uh, Benjamin. Says, yep. uh, how, how do you image at intermediate distances and not just at the end of the wave, right? Are those uh, devices? Um, right, we, we didn't, we didn't. Uh, we've now figured out how to do that, actually. I'm not sure I'll come to that, but I, I'm happy to talk about it. But in this case, we, this is all at the same length. So this is all with different samples, with different radii, so different drive strengths. So you went to strong, bigger and bigger radius, but the same time and all different samples. So we're not able to see in this experiment inside. 
Um, yeah. Great. Now, so, you know, I, so since I think I probably won't get there, um, I'll mention that my, one of my students, uh, Marius uh, Jorgensen, developed this wonderful technique where he, he actually used the laser to kind of cut the sample very precisely at different Zs. So he kind of damages the sample on a very, very precise uh, line and then uh, snaps it off and polishes it and then redoes the experiment uh, so that we can actually um, see this evolution as a function of Z. Um, that's a um, different technique was used by um, a dead Silverberg. Um, yeah, he was, he's a theorist who was working with Jeroen Silverberg's group. They did a similar thing where they did a bunch of cuts. Um, so this is very time consuming and laborious to do, but um, we, are, we came up with another trick I'll tell you about for how to see the dynamics of the chiral ledge states. So um, this goes uh, to a question that you asked, Luis. Um, uh, so you asked what the role of the, the laser frequency was. And my answer was that it um, basically factors into the coupling, right? But the, the, the hopping, basically the degree of hopping between the depth of the potential well, as well as therefore the degree of hopping from site to site, right? Because if you have a shallower potential well, then of course the evanescent tail is bigger and so the hopping is greater. So by tuning the frequency of the laser, we can actually change the system effectively to have higher or lower hopping. And so we, we thought, okay, well, we can use that to be able to observe the dynamics of the chiral edge state. So it's not actually temporal dynamics as a function of time, but it's the next best thing, which is you tune the laser and you're looking effectively at different models with larger and larger hopping. And so you can see the edge state move as a result. So this is an experiment that we did like five years later after the original one in which we could see the chiral edge state move. So in this case, you inject in the bottom left and you see the edge state move along the bottom right. So at the time of the original experiment, we would have never expected, we've never been able to get these kind of dynamics. So here we're actually seeing dynamics. Whereas you inject in the bottom right and you see it move up along the side. Um, so this is part of one counterclockwise edge state. But we were finally able to access the regime that we wanted to get to, which is past the topological transition. Um, in other words, um, in this case, we've got helices going uh, counterclockwise, but because we've changed the churn number actually from churn one to churn minus one, the uh, edge states are gonna be moving in a rotational sense, which is opposite the, um, that of the helices. So you inject in the bottom left, it goes up along the side here. You inject in the bottom right, um, it goes along the bottom. So now it's going clockwise. It's going opposite of the helices, which is really kind of, to us, that was very cool because early, in early experiments, we weren't able to access that regime. And the trick was basically that, um, you know, it's totally obvious in retrospect, but the strength of the gauge field goes like, omega squared r, where omega is the drive frequency and r is the radius of the helix. So um, what we could do is sacrifice a bit on omega um, and make up for it in r. And that took us into the regime uh, that we were looking to go in. Um, and uh, so, we, so we didn't, or sorry, that, that's, not the, that's not the strength of the gauge field, that's the amount of heating. So the amount of bend, bending loss. So that's what we were preventing, or that's what we were trying to, you know, not increase too much. And we realized that if we just make very long helix pitches, 2.4 centimeters, much longer than we're used to, then we could really make these huge helix, helix radius radii. So the radii here is like five, the radius is five times the size of the uh, nearest neighbor space on that order. So, um, that way we could mitigate bending loss. So we got a whole phase diagram here of the, of the different churn numbers uh, as a function of the drive frequency and the uh, radius, uh, the, the, uh, the, the strength of the gauge field, uh, which goes like R omega, not R omega squared. Okay, 
So we were able to go basically from this regime up here to this regime down there, churn plus one to churn minus one. We weren't able to access the churn minus two. I mean, we probably did access it without knowing it. It's just the group velocities are very slow in that regime because it's kind of this tiny regime in which the gap doesn't open very much. So we weren't able to definitively establish that we were there given, given the constraints uh, experiment. Okay, now I want to talk about- Michael, uh, yes. Michael, please, in the last slide, Yes. Uh, how do you characterize this topological trans transition? How, how do we characterize it? Um, do yeah. you mean mentally or theoretically or? Uh, look, uh, you talked about the, the change in the character number, but when you show a topological transition, usually we also talk about the universality class. And in this sense, uh, how, how you and your group have figured out this kind of, of universality class in your system? I see. Well, I, uh, you know, there's no, um, you, uh, so we don't characterize it in that way. It is, it's a, definitely is a phase transition because we have the gap closing. Um, there's no, it's not really thermodynamic in the sense that uh, it's not like we, have some sort of diverging correlation length as in a second order phase transition. Um, so we don't characterize it that way. We just say, okay, we can calculate the churn number that tells us the nature of the, of the topological phase. Um, I don't know if the, that there's a, I mean, I guess if you have disorder, you can talk about what happens near the transition, but that's not the sense in which we were studying this room. Right, thank you for your attention. <laughs> no problem. Okay, so um, we wanna ask the question of um, solitons. Um, th this is something that comes up very often as very contemporary research topic in optics. Uh, they come up all the time as I will explain and I'll, I'll explain exactly what they are. So we wanted to really, this is a question about the interplay between nonlinear dynamics and um, topologically non-trivial systems, which is, um, which is sort of a question that's intrinsic to optics and very non-condensed mattery because this is, a, this is a very bosonic question. You need to, to be able to talk about nonlinearity and the Gross-Potowski equation, nonlinear Schrodinger equation, you really need to have many, many photons per state um, in a given state. And so this is something that just doesn't come up in the electronic context. I mean, you, can, you can argue like in, in, um, in superfluids, um, it, it comes up, you know, there's a, there's a Gross-Potowski description in uh, some other context, but this is, this is really an optics thing in my view. Okay, so th that's the question we're asking. What happens if you combine the nonlinear term, just like someone was asking about earlier, with a topological Hamilton? Um, do the interplay between the two of them give um, new physics? So is it, what is the physics um, described by, you know, what you could call topological nonlinear optics? You know, what, what, what new phenomena can we uncover? Um, and this really goes, as, as I was saying, goes really well beyond sense in which we're making optical analogies because, you know, we're, we're asking about bosonic systems here. Okay. Um, I do, I do want to say that um, the description of interacting bosonic systems is something very universal. So usually when you have interacting bosons, they are described by some variant of Bose-Hubbard model, which in the mean field limit, when you have many, many particles, many, many bosons per site, high density is, uh, um, can be described as a mean, in a mean field model, um, like the nonlinear Schrodinger equation or gross Petersky equation, which is the same thing. Um, and so by studying this in the context of photonics, we're really also asking questions about Ultra cold atoms, ultra cold bosons, also uh, exciton polaritons, ex excitons by themselves, um, and phonons, whatever else. Right? Um, so, as long as you have interacting bosons, you basically have something like this, more or less. You know, there's 
course variance on it, but you have more or less that. Okay. What, what this is saying is that we're using the Kerr effect of the medium, nonlinear polarization of the medium, um, to mediate the interaction between photons. Uh, the way to say it in the nonlinear context, nonlinear optics, is you say, okay, the beam is coming in. It's a very, very intense laser beam. By virtue of the intensity of the beam, you are changing the medium. So you're creating a new potential, which is a function of the beam itself, um, in which that beam has to now live. Right. So those are the same thing. Yeah, it's just different language. Okay. Here's the problem. We're working with glass, any kind of glass. We use a particular glass, which is borosilicate, which uh, we get these really great high quality samples from Corning. Um, um, so it's their, their proprietary name for it is Eagle XG glass. And it's a particular mixture, which they won't tell us what it is basically. Um, but it's, it's borosilicate and um, it's a very, any kind of glass, standard glass you know, with exceptions for calcogenides and others, it's very linear medium. You really have to work hard to get it to be nonlinear. So um, we were using CW light, which is very fundamental to the equations that I derived for you because we, you're talking about a fixed frequency, right? One particular frequency, just like a laser beam, that's a CW beam. You have, you're talking about one color. Um, but there is no way we'd be able to ever get nonlinear behavior, given the power constraints that we have with um, a CW beam. We need something like megawatts. If you had a megawatt laser pointer, you would drill a hole through the wall. So you, that's not going to happen in in our lab. Actually, that you much you, you blow up. I don't know what you blow up, but that's a lot of power megawatts. Um, so what we need to use is pulsed lasers where basically what you do is you collect all the power into a very, very, very short time interval. We're talking about something like a picosecond um, and you blast it and then it responds instantaneously. Um, so we wanted to do a few sanity checks given that now we're kind of deviating away from our assumptions on the nonlinear Schrodinger equation by using a pulse laser where there's actually temporal dynamics now because things are happening as a function of time right? Um, so we had to do these sanity checks to make sure that, you know, we're, we're still working with a nonlinear Schrodinger equation. So the first thing is a nonlinear loss. So we just check the output power as a function of input power and check that it's linear. You can get something called two photon absorption, depend, depending on the band gap of your material, the electronic band gap, where, you know, you get greater and greater loss as you increase the power. And so this linear fit here suggests that that's not the case. So we're good on that. So that checks out. Nonlinear Schrodinger equation conserves power, just as this does. So that's good. Um, even more importantly, um, cell phase modulation. So what can happen when you inject pulses into media is the natural thing that happens is you get broadening of your spectrum through cell phase modulation. If we have 200 nanometers of bandwidth, which is what you do if you just naively inject a pulse that has enough power to, to get this effect, then the, the hopping, as I was saying before, hopping changes by, you know, at least an order of magnitude over 200 nanometers. So then you don't have a well-defined hopping and it's not the nonlinear Schrodinger equation anymore. So we had to, the, you know, predictably the most minor part of the, of the work took the longest time, which is we spent six months sort of figuring out how to manipulate the pulse so we didn't get too much cell phase modulation, maybe four months, I don't know. So a lot, lot of, you know, a lot of debugging with that. And so we figured out a way to make sure that we didn't broaden the spectrum too much. And so it still lived over 20 nanometers over which the hopping only changes by something like 5%. So this is just the variation in the hopping as a function of wavelength. So we still have a, a hopping that's good to within 5%. So we deem that to be okay. And we say, okay, we're, we are working with a nonlinear Schrodinger equation. This is all with just a single wave band. Now I have to tell you what a soliton is. So as I said, what nonlinearity does is to change the, the medium. Um, and then the, the beam that you're putting in has to react to that now changed medium. It's, it's because you have a beam, you have a, you're inducing a potential 
So that now there's this new potential in which the beam itself lives. And so a soliton is the following. It's a beam that is itself the bound state of the potential well that it creates. So it's a nonlinear eigenstate of the system. So it, the beam comes in, it creates a potential. It itself is the bound state of that potential, which then creates the potential in which it is a bound state in this self-consistent loop. So what's it doing? It's creating a waveguide for itself. So in the linear regime, what happens is you inject light here, it spreads out, it diffracts. Whereas in the nonlinear regime with sufficient power, if you get the wave function right, you inject the beam, it creates a, a potential well in which it exists as the bound state. So it's created its own waveguide. Solitons are very fundamental. Um, if you start out with just a plane wave and evolve it with a little bit of noise, you find that it's unstable in the focusing regime. Um, and it falls apart into these solitons, which you see here. So the solitons are, for many nonlinear PDEs, they're kind of the, um, the base solution there. They're the fundamental ingredient, just like a plane wave you can think of as a fundamental ingredient in the Schrodinger equation. This, a soliton is a fundamental ingredient of the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Um, they are a topic of perennial research, consistent research, going back to when they were first observed, um, you know, in the 1860s, I think it was in, in Scotland in the context of uh, water waves by a naval engineer. Um, in optics, um, they were observed now more than 50 years ago um, um, in, in the context of temporal, temporal solitons, solitons of time. Um, now they're being used, like in the groups of Kerry Vahala and Tobias Kippenberg and Alex Gaeta, to form these ultra stable frequency combs for uh, metrology. Really, absolutely amazing stuff in, in ring resonators. Um, they're used in um, passive mode locking. Um, you know, they are in some sense a fundamental element of uh, topological physics because that, that's how SSH model was originally conceived of the context of the solitons in these polymer chains. Um, in ultra cold atoms, you know, big flurry of activity about 10 years ago or 15 years ago or whatever it was, um, because you have, you know, it's the same equation pretty much. Um, so very universal phenomena. We wanted to ask, okay, what are the nature of solitons in topological systems? Okay, so um, the natural thing would be to just inject into our honeycomb lattice and turn up the power, right, and see what happens. But uh, it turns out we really wanted to have only one gap. So, uh, you know, as Luis was, was saying, there's this pi gap, which is up here. And then there's the uh, standard holiday type gap down here. So that's, there really are two gaps in Floquet systems because as uh, you've, you've learned, Floquet systems are periodic. Um, their band structures are periodic, both in sort of spatial momentum and then also in quasi energy. So um, uh, because they're, they're periodic in both senses, both the vertical and horizontal directions in the band structure, um, you really have two gaps here. And we want to be able to say, because we don't have spectral resolution really in the system, we want to definitively say which soliton we're talking about. So we want to work with a model with one gap. So we used this anomalous um, Floquet system, which is an idea of uh, Mark Redner, one of your speakers along with his, um, you know, the, the, his usual gang of, of uh, collaborators. Um, um, they show that if you have models where you have uh, Floquet systems that, uh, you know, that come close to one another, where the atoms come close to one another and then separate, and then the next one kind of does this sort of idiosyncratic model where you have uh, hoppings that increase and then go back to zero in this sequence, just like these waveguides are doing here, they're getting closer to one another and then separating. Um, so you can have hopping for a little bit and then you don't have hopping. Um, in this model, you can get what's called a anomalous Floquet topological insulator because it's a, it doesn't have a churn number actually, so it's churn zero. Um, and yet it does have chiral edge states. Um, and um, so there's the bulk bands in blue and here's the edge bands. It's just a single gap, which is below and above uh, the bulk band. And so we want to look at the solitons in this context just because then we know which gap they're coming from because there's only one and they're always in gaps. So first we just did a, a sanity check um, and we just looked at the square lattice 
Um, so here's what, what you're seeing here is the diffraction pattern coming out of a square lattice. Uh, if we inject it to a single site and then wave got spread. So each little peak here is corresponds to the amplitude of the wave function in a given waveguide. So this is like a particular waveguide. This is real space. Um, and what we also plot is the IPR, inverse participation ratio, which is the basically a measure of localization. So high IPR means more localized, low IPR means less localized. Um, and now we increase the power. And what we see is we get this strong self-focusing of the square lattice soliton. The IPR increases rapidly and we get this you know, clear soliton. Uh, strong self-focusing. Um, so this is a, our sanity check because this is a well-known result for now, I don't know, what, a, what is it, 20 years or something. Okay, so this is just how this nonlinearity is working in our system. Oops. Um, okay. Okay, now the Floquet soliton. So this was the, the structure of the soliton. It's a Floquet soliton in the sense that um, we solve it in a Floquet sense. It comes back to itself times a phase after a full period. Back to itself times a phase. Um, and so what happens, uh, so I can actually show you what it looks like. So here's the soliton. It's this bright spot here, which is rotating with the motion of the lattice. And then you have these kind of what we call the legs, which, which are rotating around with it. So the normal solitons don't change, but this is a Floquet system. So to us, Floquet solitons are just Floquet solutions, just like Floquet eigenstates are Floquet solutions. And, and they're localized in space. Um, and so actually the way we, we have sort of a funny interpretation for this, at least in the, in the high power regime, in which what we're doing is we are detuning a waveguide so, um, strongly here that it's actually inducing a vacuum, right? Because when you detune a waveguide very, very strongly using the nonlinearity, if it has such a different energy, it's, it's the same as removing it from the system, it's so detuned. Um, and so what we have is like a, a detuned site which is moving around, and then there's a chiral edge state that surrounds the vacuum because now we have this topologically non-trivial medium surrounding a trivial medium because you have this empty spot. And so the soliton is kind of its own chiral edge state in a way, at least the outer parts of it are. So it's kind of this funny interpretation. Um, it, spectrally speaking, what happens is the soliton bifurcates from the linear bands. It comes off the size as a function of increasing power. Blue is the uh, bulk bands and red is the energy of the soliton. Um, and then it comes out comes back from the other side and it hybridizes again from the other side with the bulk band. So, so what you expect is, unlike the square lattice soliton, which got more and more and more localized as you increase power, um, the Floquet soliton bifurcates off the band. And then because there's this wrapping, because the quasi energy is periodic, it's coming back from the other side and it's going to talk to the bulk band and that will make it um, spread. So that's precisely what we see when we calculate the soliton self consistently or even dynamically. Um, what we see is this increase in IPR as a function of power followed by a decrease in IPR. So you go to higher and higher power, you see this non-monotonic behavior associated with this peak. And that's the Floquet soliton kind of bifurcating off the linear band, wrapping around, then coming back and then hitting it again from the other side. So he, here's the soliton now as a function of power for a particular slice in Z. So you see it's getting more and more localized and then less and less localized. All right, so it's, it starts out big, gets small, and then it gets big again. So here's the experiment. Um, we inject into this site here. And what we see is that, that the light spreads out to different lattice sites. Um, and we're just going to measure the IPR as a function of increasing power. So we increase the input power and see what happens. 
So what you see is the soliton starts to strongly localize. We reach a peak in the IPR, and then it decreases as it spreads out more and more. So as it approaches the band from the other side, um, it, it spreads out. So this is the sort of signature peak associated with um, the presence of the Floquet soliton. Oh, Babak, you have a question. Yes. Um, so, so here you're looking at z equal two t. Is there a reason specifically for that? Or yes. So t is the um, t is the period. Right. Of the drive. Um, we're very limited in the number of uh, periods that we can do, basically because of bending loss or heating. Okay. So we can't do something like 10 because um, we would have to move these things in and out too quickly and we would lose all the light. Um, and particularly in a nonlinear experiment, we're much more sensitive to that than in a linear experiment because for a linear experiment, it just comes down to when we can actually see it and the signal to noise because of the heating. For a nonlinear experiment, we need all the power to mm -hmm. actually give it nonlinearity. Okay. So this is only through two periods of the drive, whereas mm -hmm. the results that you saw for the um, for the uh, original turn insulator is about 10 periods of the drive. Right. And then I have another question. So you mentioned this about 5% variation in your coupling, yeah. um, in your um, um, uh, in your system. Yeah. So can I think of that? I mean, when you create this sort of anomalous uh, Fouquet um, realization, um, can I think of that as sort of disorder um, or does that depend on? Um, yes. Um, else? Yeah. Um, th there is fabrication disorder, right? Um, right. So there is, there's standard fabrication disorder. That's quite a bit less than 5%. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've characterized that for, you know, it, it's very sensitive to what the actual separation is, but it's like on the scale of something like 1% or so. Um, uh, maybe a little more than that. Um, this is different because what you have here is one way to think of it, although this is not perfect, is you have all these different beams at different wavelengths, each with different hoppings sitting on top of one another, right? Right. Um, so it's almost like you were, you were putting, you're simultaneously looking at systems of different hoppings, but you, can, you can't resolve the differences between them. They all get I see. washed out, right? So what we see when we don't compensate for the cell phase modulation is just kind of washing out of everything and lots of background noise, every waveguide occupied to some extent uh, because the hoppings are all so different. So it's not, I don't think it's right to think of it as disorder. It's, that's not even exactly right either because that would be right if we were injecting a broadband laser into this with a bandwidth of say, you know, 10 or 20 nanometers or whatever it was. I think it's about 20 nanometers. But that's not what's happening because we're injecting pulses. And so you can look in the time domain and say, okay, well, actually the tails are, of the pulse in time are behaving linearly because they're very low intensity, whereas the peak is behaving non-linearly. So it's this complicated process. Um, Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. where all we can do is kind of benchmark it and see. Okay. Okay. So it sounds like this will contribute a particular way of non, or a particular nonlinear, uh, it's a particular nonlinear contribution, Yeah. the equations that depends on the wavelength and, and so on. Yeah. Yes, right. yes, that's okay. right. Yeah. And it depends, it depends on, it's inescapable because we need high nonlinearity. And so that's accompanied by this broadening. Right. Uh, so all we can do is do our best to minimize it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So um, this is another set of data in which we just show. So if you remember in the in the form of the soliton, it 
has it sort of moves around a plaquette like this, just sort of as governed by the, these waveguides coming closer and farther apart. So it's actually going around a little square. Um, and so we wanted to show that. So we cut in one period. We cut through half a period here. So this is just one and a half instead of two. So uh, we show that the peak is really on the other side. So we inject here where the red arrow is, and then it's moved to the other side where now you have a peak. Um, and so showing that it's on the other side shows that it hasn't just been completely trapped into a, a waveguide that we inject into it. Uh, and we get the exact same behavior. So we get this characteristic peak. Okay. All right, so we also wanted to ask about what was going on, on the edge. So that's, that's what happens in the bulk. Those are bulk solitons, but we wanted to ask about edge solitons as well. So, you know, it's a pretty natural question to ask because you want to know, you know, if we're going to use these topological devices for real applications, maybe not in this geometry, but in photonic crystals or another context. Um, well, um, you know, in the nonlinear context, solitons are going to form and what are going to be the properties of the solitons? Can we topologically protect them? And in what sense? Right. Uh, of course, everything that's been derived for chiral edge states, as we understand them, is really a, a completely linear, right? So uh, non-interacting. So what happens in the nonlinear case? That's, that's, the, uh, that's the question here. We use a very similar model. Um, it's, again, this kind of uh, Rudner anomalous thing where the waveguides are getting close to um, one another and farther apart, except we introduce a parameter, which we call delta, um, which is just the following. So we, we have two different types of steps. So there's, there's four steps in the process, but, but two of them are different than the other two. So we have two waveguides come close to one another. They stay together for a certain amount of time, or Z. Uh, and then they separate and then they come, then two others come together for a shorter amount of time. And that difference is delta. And that basically, that gives us a tuning parameter where we can tune from this perfectly flat band regime in which actually the soliton has no power threshold to be realized um, uh, into the uh, dispersive regime where you have some dispersion of the bulk bands as well as the edge bands. So we can use that as a, as a tuning knob, which we need to sort of establish the, um, the presence of the solitons. Okay, um, what we find is, is interesting is, so uh, in the linear regime, we get some sort of expected diffraction along the edge. Um, whereas in the nonlinear regime, um, you increase the power and you see this strong self-focusing, but where there is some radiation both along the edge and into the bulk, right? So you see this strong self-focusing, the formation of the soliton. And if you go to even stronger power, then you're sort of strongly detuning the soliton such that, um, you know, you get this huge amount of both bulk and edge radiation. You're hybridizing with the band on the other side um, and it, it, you have sort of more power than the soliton can tolerate while it's along the edge. Um, and that's what you're seeing in this plot here. So this is just basically a plot of um, the soliton uh, lifetime. So we've got power here um, and the um, Z, the, the time in which it lives. And what you can see is that there's this, there's this decay of the soliton um, uh, as a function of time, no matter what you do. And that's because of this radiation. Um, so this is sort of an interesting thing that we have to take note of here, which is that these solitons, which are chiral edge states, chiral edge state solitons, they have some radiation associated with them, which is not altogether unexpected and even happens in 1D models where you have moving solitons. Because basically what is happening is that as it's moving, the lattice is kind of acting like a potential, which is oscillating. 
the nonlinearity, by virtue of the nonlinearity, you have this sort of oscillating potential, which is causing some radiation. Kind of like a Fermi golden rule kind of thing. Um, what you see is that as you increase power, you get different peaks depending on what that delta parameter is. So here's three different deltas that we consider in the experiment. Um, and I haven't shown you the experimental results yet, but um, just as a, as a prelude, um, what you see is that as you go to larger and larger delta, the peaks move to larger and larger powers. Um, yeah. Okay. So here's the kind of uh, cartoon picture of what's going on. Um, in the linear regime, you have this fast diffraction of the wave packet, just like you'd expect for any wave packet, um, but it's topologically protected, it doesn't scatter, and it doesn't go into the bulk. Whereas in the, no in the nonlinear regime, um, the wave packet stays together better, but it does lose power to radiation. So the question that we have to ask is, um, well, are the benefits of topological protection going to outweigh the problem of radiation? Um, and in what regimes will that be true? How fast does the radiation happen? Um, is it worth it in the nonlinear regime? What happens and what cost do you have to pay? And so that's kind of something that we're really interested in in figuring out now is that what, what is the price of uh, topological protection to nonlinear devices in terms of this radiative loss? And to, so to us, that's an open question. Um, so here's uh, the observation of um, uh, edge state. So again, we don't have many periods to do this just because of um, bend loss, but we inject here where the white circle is here. And then in the linear regime, we see spreading out um, both some into the bulk because you don't couple to the edge state perfectly and mostly along the edge. And what you see is when you increase power, you strongly self-focus along the edge. Um, and then as you reach this regime in which uh, you have more spreading, you can see that the IPR goes down correspondingly. So this uh, peak corresponds to the um, formation of the most localized solid. And so here's a plot of exactly that for those three different values of delta. And you can see that just as the numerics predicted, um, for larger and larger delta, the peak moves out to higher and higher. So more dispersion, it's very natural, the more dispersion, the higher power you need to form the solid top. Right? In the flat band limit, where delta is zero, um, you don't actually, a linear wave packet is a solid top because it's totally flat band, it doesn't disperse. So that it's just, um, this is not saying anything unexpected by any means, it's just a way of showing that we're seeing what we think we're seeing. Um, and here, what you see is the, um, the solid time moving around the corner um, and then moving along the edge uh, for higher and higher power, uh, just, just as in the linear case. So here's linear, here's the soliton. Um, and then this is sort of when you have too much power in some sense. OK, um, this is the next section on quantized nonlinear thallus pumps. I, I don't think I have enough time to really go into it because um, it looks like I have 13 minutes left. I can kind of start and see where I go. Um, uh, I prefer, uh, Michael, we, we, you could give a flash of it or we could go to sure. questions if you prefer. Yeah, why don't I give a very brief summary so that if anyone's interested, they can go check it out. Great. Um, okay, so uh, so first of all, this is really the work of um, of Marius uh, Jurgensen and Seba Mukherjee. Seba's the former mm -hmm. postdoc that I talked about. Marius is still in the group. Um, and uh, I really, uh, you know, owe them a lot. A lot, of, a lot of what came out of this is really their ideas um, and their um, experimental and theoretical genius. <laughs> so, so I'm uh, really grateful for them. Um, okay. So, Dallas Pumps, let me tell you briefly what they are. Um, they are 
time dependent driven systems, but they're driven adiabatically. This is basically another way of understanding quantization in the quantum Hall effect. This is when in the early 80s, when people were trying to figure out what was giving rise to this quantization, David Thales came up with this very simple model of a one dimensional driven system, which gave quantization, um, uh, which is really, really quite striking. So the closest analogy is this Archimedes uh, screw pump, um, where basically you turn the crank and you're bringing a fixed amount of water in each turn, one whole period up from the river or to the bank. And so you can think of the water molecules in there as being like electrons, you're bringing you go through one turn of the crank, you are periodically driving this one dimensional system to bring water from one side of the system to the other. And it's a fixed amount. And the turns out the number of electrons you bring from one side to the other, that's really in a certain sense, the churn number of, of a, an associated two dimensional churn insulator, kind of really deep. Again, what Thala showed is you absolutely have to be living in a gap. You must have filled bands for this to work. Otherwise it's just not quantized. You don't bring a quantized number of electrons up. It's gotta be an insulator. Um, so I won't go through everything, but I've got you know sort of a, another phenomenological picture of how this works in terms of electron electrons moving over. Um, this is sort of similar to a, a Laughlin pump. But we basically we realize this using a one-dimensional waveguide array, just like the waveguides I was talking about before. The waveguides are wiggling as a function of Z, so that, that's how you get the thallus pump behavior. Um, they are topological. They correspond to a to churn insulators in the dimensionally extended uh, uh, picture. Um, and what we show, without going into a ton of detail, is that, interestingly, you find that solitons, so this is a soliton here, exhibit quantized motion. Their centers of mass move in a quantized way according to the churn number in thallus pumps. And this is something that is completely unexpected um, because there's no sense in which they fill the band, right? You take the soliton wave function, you project it onto a band and you just get some random thing which depends on power and it's totally non-uniform. And yet these solitons are pumping exactly according to the churn number in the low power regime. Um, and so we struggled with this for like a many months, maybe about a year or something. Um, and we finally have a proof for why this works. The intuition for why it's quantized is um, basically that there's only a certain number of soliton solutions available. Um, and it's basically really just one per band per uh, unit cell at low power. So of course it's still a periodic system. So if you have a soliton on one unit cell then you're gonna have soliton centered on the next unit cell and so on. So it has to either come back to itself or come back to itself modulo um, a unit cell. So there's, that's the origin of the quantization. Why, why the churn number? Well, that's more complicated and that sort of comes up this proof. Um, so we have a PRL on this from, from last year that um, that you can check out. Um, but in the high power regime, kind of all bets are off and you can, you can get other kinds of quantization. So what, what we showed um, is that you can even, you can get fractional quantization. Um, so let me show that. Um, so in more complex models, you can get quantization, um, to fractional numbers of unit cells. So these red and blue lines represent the 1A functions of particular bands and each gray region represents a unit cell. So the blue one here is uh, moving over by two unit cells through one period of the pump, whereas the red one is moving back by one unit cell uh, through one period of the pump. And through nonlinear bifurcations, you can sort of follow different 1A functions. So the soliton, can go back and forth so that there it's got half a unit cell through one period. And now it goes a full unit cell through um, uh, the next period. So through, through two unit cell, through two periods of the pump, you've gone one unit cell. So on average, half a unit cell per period of the pump. So it's fractional pumping. Um, 
and you need the nonlinearity to do this. And my, my student uh, Sachin Vedia came along at some point and said, okay, well, why not, instead of looking at the 1A functions of the individual bands, look at the multi-band 1A functions of these models. And we found like very, very close agreement, not exact, um, uh, but in terms of the pumping through a full period, it is exact correspondence between um, the multiband 1A function and the soliton. So whatever the multiband 1A function does in terms of pumping through a whole period, as does the soliton. Um, and it's sort of very predictive in that sense. And this is something that wouldn't work in the, non, in the linear regime. It's really intrinsic to the nonlinear regime. So, um, um, so here's the experimental results on that. This is kind of cool. This is the experiment I mentioned, in which uh, my student Marius cut um, the, the sample 10 times. So I'm just gonna increase power here. Left is experiment, right is simulation. You're gonna see this, the formation of the soliton um, as you increase power. So the soliton forms, it becomes very localized. And what you see is that it's moved over by precisely one unit cell, which in this case is five sites. So exactly one unit cell over the course of two pump periods. So one unit cell, two pump periods, half a unit cell per pump period. Um, so we're really seeing that quantization happen here. You get all sorts of weird fractions coming out of more complicated models. So of course, this is it, it, this evokes the fractional quantum Hall effect, but we know that it's very different. Um, you know, it's this is a mean field description. It's not a many body description. Um, these are two different phenomena, but they are associated with fractionalization of transport. So um, the best we can say really is what we hope that this establishes is that the fractionalization of transport is maybe a more generic phenomenon, more, um, you know, something more universal than when you include topology and interactions than what we thought before, just in terms of the fractional quantum Hall effect. But this fractionalization is sort of intrinsically a property of combining interactions and topology in multiple different contexts. Okay, so um, I, I should leave some time for questions, so I will stop here. I can't go into this section. I was overly ambitious in what I thought I could get to. Uh, so I'll stop here. I'll put my last slide with uh, past and present group members and the funders, and thanks very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mikael. Excellent. Excellent. Time for questions. I have a couple of questions, so I don't know. I'll, I'll break the ice. Um, yes, yeah, one, of the that, uh, one of the things that, that you mentioned is that um, several times during during your presentations is that you have uh, losses uh, around, and uh, I was wondering uh, in your case probably the losses are homogeneously distributed, and um, I, I was I was uh, wondering you know there's uh, all this wave of people interested in in non-emission effects. So as soon as you have uh, losses that are not homogeneously distributed in your system, you could start having interesting effects as well. I don't know if you have thought about this. Yes. Um, actually, if I can be a little immodest uh, for a second, we had the first paper on this, on this stuff. Um, so um, what, we, what we showed was, so this is back in 2015, um, what we showed is that if you have alternating uh, loss, no loss, loss, no loss, you know, so it's a non-trivially non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, um, based on ideas from um, Mark Rudner and Leonard Levitov, um, they showed that through the dynamics of um, uh, electrons in the, in the diffracting through the basically the bulk of such a lattice. They were thinking in terms of energy levels, but it's the same thing. Um, um, they show that you could extract the topological invariant purely from bulk diffraction in such a system. 
Um, and the invariant came down to basically an integral over the history of the electronic wave function. So we, um, we used um, fluorescent glass um, in, in Alex Samite, the Alex Samite's lab, where you could see the whole, whole wave function from above, which you could do in one dimensional systems. Um, and um, you could track then the whole evolution. Uh, so I could actually bring that up quickly. Let's see if I can find it here. So if I go to, um, oh no, uh, Rudner was on paper, Rudner. So we could see this. Uh, so what we did is we had sort of wiggly waveguides. So you have these wiggly waveguides here. Um, the wiggling induced loss. So they were wiggling much, much faster than the Floquet um, drive so that it was just basically incoherent loss as opposed to the Floquet drive. And then we could see this um, transition of the winding number. So here's the experimental data in which we see this transition um, around the uh, dimerization point of a, of a SSH-like um, model, basically. Oh, um, very interesting, very yeah. interesting. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Yeah, More questions. Fine. I have another question if, if no one is jumping <laughs> the list. <laughs> so uh, maybe on top of what you were just talking about, um, do you have um, fine control of these loss? Like, can you engineer the loss to, you know, in space or in, well, I guess it's all space for you, but. <laughs> yes, um, yes, definitely. Um, the oscillations, uh, the oscillation period and the oscillation amplitude will just give you the amount of loss. So okay. you just calibrate that um, sort of backwards, right? So you, uh, you do a calibration by scanning the, say the amplitude, um, mm -hmm. And that will give you a loss as a function of amplitude, and then you decide which. Right. Loss so with that, so so I guess that means that you can control locally and in time. Yes. How the loss happens. Arbitrarily. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Interesting. Okay. Yes. You have to wiggle it fast enough so that um, you know you're you're not doing weird things to the phase. I see. Um, and it's yeah. also true that uh, so this so the flexibility actually of the of Rudner and Levitov's model allowed us to get away with this, that um, if you're wiggling it, you are picking up extra phase because there's extra path length. So you do have a detuning. Now, luckily that didn't affect the, the results in the model. I see. Um, so you, you do, you, it's very hard to get um, just pure loss without also an, sort of an on-site real term um without like difficult fine-tuning okay thanks we have a question by fabio right <laughs> thank you Luis, for the word Marco, it's me again in that slide when you showed the production of radiation due to nonlinearity effects if i could understand co co correctly uh this radiation is intrinsically coupled with the nonlinearity of the medium and uh, if is in this way, have you carried on a study on, on understanding the nature of this radiation field? Um, um, we, to us, it's coupled in the sense that the more radiation you have, the less nonlinearity you have, because we think of it just as loss. So we think of it as populating other bands that then we can't access anymore and they, they're just kind of gone. Um, so we haven't done any analysis beyond that, beyond just saying oh, we're treating it as loss. It therefore hampers the nonlinearity if we're doing a nonlinear experiment. We've, we've never combined an experiment in which we have loss and nonlinearity because it's just too difficult. It's, you know, you need the power. You really, really need the power because glass is, you have to work very hard to get nonlinearity to begin with. Um, yeah. So it's right. already hard enough when it's okay. So. Right, right. Thank you for your entry. Yeah. Thank you. Great.
I, I have one more question. I don't know, Babak, do you have? I, I, have I can one ask more. one more, but you, I, I already did one, so <laughs> I don't know how much time Mikhail has now. We're oh, I can I can sit here. I'm I'm always happy to talk about my stuff. You know? <laughs> I, have, I have one very very naive uh, question. Um, you know, if, if if you think of of uh, suppose I'm I'm always thinking of electrons. So so I, I have a band structure, and I, if I think of interaction with light, usually the processes that you have are vertical processes. And um, so you, you have convinced us how, how you do it with, with uh, these photonic systems that you emulate essentially the same now with, with the photonic systems with some um, new effects as well. And, and now, could you think of a way of um, having also momentum exchange? So the process is now not be purely vertical. So I imagine you're, you know, you have your, your guides that are wiggling, but they are coming back. And what if I think that I, I, uh, I don't know, I shift the system in some funny way? Could, could I have also momentum exchange? Um, let me see if I understand. When you, so when you say vertical, you, you're saying um, vector. I have energy wave vector. The process. Oh, okay, right, right. Uh -huh. Okay, I see. Yeah, abs well, absolutely. Um, well, we've done a lot on disordered systems. In mm -hmm. which, in which case, you know, you lose the momenta and you scatter from one momenta to to another one. Um, um, let's see. Anytime you have a defect, you're scattering from one momenta to the next. Yeah, but but, but now if you think of of this uh, Floquet direction, you know, the yes. this the time for you. Yes. If you couple both, you would have the the analog of, for example, uh, uh, interaction with a phonon in in electrons. Or, or oh yeah, yeah. You have also momentum exchange. Yeah, so you you have some sort of modulation, which you're you 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 what you would need is some sort of moving wave in the potential. So the yeah. potential would look like uh, cosine of uh, kx minus omega t or something. Right. 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 Um, well, I guess that's what a that's kind of what a thallus pump is in a way. Um, but although it's adiabatic, so if you were to do it faster, oh. it's kind of that. Um, but it's not exactly it's not exactly the same. They have done that actually. So in the work of um, showing Fan and Michal Ibsen in uh, photonics, um, they use that kind of logic to engineer. Um, non-reciprocal one-dimensional devices, optical isolators. So that, that's kind of a huge problem in photonics is how do you make a very small diode, but it's a diode for light. You know, for electron, a diode is very easy because of how nonlinear, like, you know, just make a transistor or whatever. Um, but for photons, it's very hard because of the intrinsic reciprocity of most materials. And um, so they've used exactly that kind of potential. I could send you their paper uh, where you have a tr kind of a traveling wave. You're exchanging energy and momentum to achieve this kind of one-way transport. But I haven't really thought about that too much. It's just, just, just a question. Thanks. Thanks. I think Babak has uh, still a question. Um, maybe a quick one. Uh, so, so in these experiments, uh, you basically bring the light from an outside source. Yeah. Now, um, you could also imagine maybe structures where you have your, you know, um, Floquet photonic crystal in the middle, and then you have other stuff attached to it. Um, more like a, maybe in the electronic version, more like a transport sort of multi-terminal uh, geometry. Yes. Is there um, any interest, I mean, uh, I guess uh, I'm, I'm thinking if you're using this for in, in some device, it needs to couple to other things. And is there yeah. some interesting th things that might go on in the, in sort of those couplings with other stuff? Yes, yes. So, so we actually, we thought about that in the context of these waveguide arrays because we wanted to be able to get spectral resolution. So, you know, we have the dynamics, but we don't see what is happening in every frequency. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, whereas if you would have, oh, um, if you if you were to have um, 
like a resonator and, and the waveguide nearby, and then you inject a tunable laser into the, into the waveguide and you couple to that resonator, then you get sort of peaks and troughs associated with the resonances of that resonator. Mm -hmm. um, and then you really have spectroscopic resolution. So we're thinking, well, how do you do that exactly? You have to be sort of continually injecting at a constant frequency. So, um, so what we did was to um, create an auxiliary or what we call a straw waveguide. So you have your system, your waveguide array going like this, and then sort of very weakly coupled to it, you have another waveguide. Mm -hmm. um, and remember, so energy is KZ, energy is, is momentum. So you, you inject into that auxiliary waveguide and um, it has a particular momentum, a particular KZ, and then it's only gonna be injecting because it's weakly coupled at that particular KZ right. constantly. Okay. And so if we want to see something only happening in the gap, then we engineer a waveguide that we're sure is in the gap in terms of its um, KZ, and then it's this constant. So that is kind of what you mm -hmm. describe. Most photonic systems, I mean, there's two, two really kinds of photonic systems uh, on chips. So there's sort of waveguide or fiber-like, where you, you have propagating direction, or chip, like planar chip-like, slab-like. Mm -hmm. in which you have like a photonic crystal or a set of resonators or whatever, in which case you, you come in from the side with, with a waveguide as I described. Uh, and then you have that sort of spectroscopic uh, resolution. Um, so depending on what you're after, you can, you can sort of use one or the other. I'm okay. not sure if I exactly answered your... Yeah, I think it's related. Um, I guess we can talk more later, but um, yeah, yeah. That that's that's nice. Thanks. Sure. So I think that that uh, we have to to close the session. Thank you again. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Michael, for joining us. Great, great two lectures today. Amazing, really. I think that a lot of people will also enjoy this through YouTube, of of the the channel of of the Virtual Science Forum. And so thank you uh, a lot. And thank you. Uh, thanks thank all you. for for coming. Thanks very much. Thanks to all of you. So thank you again and uh, bye, bye. Um, keep, um, uh, please take a look at the, um, at the channel of, of the forum. You will see uh, the new videos. And so I will, I will close the session and stop the recording now.